Hey guys, a lot of you have been asking me about this shirt, uh, when I'm going to make it available. Um, the, the cheapest way I can get it to you is by selling it straight off of YouTube and I need 10,000 subscribers to do that. Uh, so if you haven't already subscribed, please just hit the subscribe button and Lord willing, uh, by the end of the month, I'll have 10,000 and we'll start, uh, we'll start putting these. And I got a couple other cool shirts uh, along these lines I'm going to put up as well. But uh, let's get started. Uh, the sacraments in the Bible confession or reconciliation uh, when I was an evangelical for many years uh, I believe the Bible taught that we're to confess our sins to one another but I always said nowhere in the Bible does it says that anyone but God has the authority to forgive sins so this is a, 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 a man-made teaching by the Catholic Church I believe that until I actually seen it in the Bible so let's start there we're gonna go to the Gospel of John chapter 20 verses 21 to 23 jesus said to them again peace be with you as the father has sent me so i send you and when he had said this he breathed on them and said to them receive the holy spirit whose sins you forgive are forgiven them whose sins you retain are retained now as an evangelical, I was taught by a lot of really smart Bible teachers, and they taught me how to properly exegete. Exegesis is the art of pulling the meaning out of the text. See, what does that text actually mean? But when it came to this, this verse, even the best uh, Bible teachers in Protestantism that I knew would use isogesis. Isogesis is adding to the text what you want it to mean. So you have a theology that says men don't have the authority to forgive sins. So you say something that it doesn't mean to make it mean something that it doesn't say, if that makes sense to you. So the only answer evangelicals can give to that verse, if they say I'm a Bible-believing Christian, I believe the Bible, I say, well, how come you don't believe that part of the Bible? They say, well, Jesus was saying you're proclaiming that sins will be forgiven. But it doesn't say that. It clearly doesn't say that. That's, um, that is clearly eisegesis. And the Calvinists are, are famous for this. Calvinists, uh, you know, uh, mostly Reformed, and there's some Baptists that are Calvinists these days, I guess. And uh, they use the text, John 3, 16, For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son. And in their theology, their systematic theology... That verse really doesn't fit because their theology teaches that God only died for the elect, not the whole world. So they jump through a bunch of hoops to get this, you know, with the scripture, twisted it around, and they come up with this theology in Calvinism that says, for God so loved the elect, he gave his only begotten son. So that's what I mean by isogesis. That's clearly isogesis. But they would say, well, you know, you have to take the, the, the verse in context to the, in the whole Bible. You know, uh, there were priests in the Old Testament that forgave sins, but now we're all priests in the New Testament. There's a royal priesthood. There's, we're all priests and kings. And I say, amen. You know, I've been at baptism since I've been in several baptisms since I've been Catholic again. And the priest always proclaims that that baptized child or adult becomes a priest and a king and a prophet in the kingdom of God. So we believe in the royal priesthood. We believe in the priesthood of all believers. But they believed in that in the Old Testament as well. The Old Testament clearly taught that the Jewish people were a royal priesthood. And they also taught that God was the one who forgave sins. We'll go to um, Isaiah. Yeah, let me go Got a lot of notes. I had to pull about 10 out because I'm like, this will get too complicated. <laughs> but um, so if you want to look up in the Old Testament, because I'm not going to give you that verse. That was one I pulled out. But the Old Testament, all the Jewish people that were circumcised, they were considered a uh, royal priest. They were considered part of the royal priesthood, just like the New Testament proclaims all Christians are part of the royal priesthood. But they still had ordained priests ministerial priests, I should say. Uh, so Isaiah chapter 43, 
verse 25. It is I, I who wipe out for my own sake your offense. Your sins I remember no more. So that's God speaking to Isaiah. So the Old Testament clearly teaches that God forgives sins. And we'll go to Psalm 103, verses 2 and 3. Bless the Lord my soul, and do not forget all his gifts, who pardons all your sins and heals all your ills. So again, it's God. It's God that forgives sins. It's God that heals us. But just like there's ministries, and I know there's been a lot of fake ministries that have a healing ministry. There's actually some legit ministries with documented healings within Protestantism and Catholicism um, with, you know, documented healings. And they would say that they have a ministry of healing, but they know ultimately they may be the ones laying hands, they may be the ones saying the prayer, but God is the healer. In the same way in the Old Testament, God forgave sins, but if you look in Leviticus, uh, Chapter 19, verse 22, with the ram of the reparation offering, the priest shall make atonement before the Lord for the wrong the man has committed, so that he will be forgiven for the wrong he has committed. So although all the Jewish people were priests, part of the royal priesthood, so to speak, just like all Christians are part of the royal priesthood, they had ministerial priests that they would go to to have their sins forgiven before God, although it was God who was ultimately forgiven them. And in the New Testament, in 2 Corinthians, uh, St. Paul talks about the ministry of reconciliation. So that same ministry that the priests in the Old Testament had, the New Testament priests received. So you're like, well, where do you see God giving the New Testament Christians, the apostles, the leaders of the church, this authority? Well, first, I showed you he gave them the authority to forgive sins. He didn't say, I give you the authority to proclaim sins are forgiven. He says, whose sins you shall forgive are forgiven. It's clear as day. If you exegete that correctly in the Greek, he's not saying anything about proclaiming sins are forgiven. But he also gives authority. Uh, the authority that Christ had... On earth, he gives to the church. And we'll find that in Matthew chapter 16, uh, verses 18 and 19. And so I say to you, you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of the netherworld shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. So he's giving this directly to St. Peter. That's one of the verses that verifies Peter was the first leader of the church, the first pope of the church. But then two chapters over in 18, 18, I believe it is, definitely Matthew 18, he gives that same authority of loosing and binding to all the apostles. So this is where the church has taught since the very beginning that it has authority to bind and loose. It has authority. And it says, I give you the keys of the kingdom. And the Jews at that time knew what it meant. Because in the Old Testament, when the master of an estate would leave for a period of time, he would give the keys to the kingdom, to his kingdom, to his estate, to one of his, one of his people that worked for him. And that person had his authority while he was gone. So Jesus gave the church his authority. Authority to do what? Number one, we read, he gave the authority to forgive sins. Number two, you know, the Bible didn't just fall out of this, out of the sky. God just didn't shoot it down from heaven. And, and I always laugh when, and I was the same way, so I don't, you know, I don't get mad at them. I just laugh because I used to think the same way. When my Protestant brother says, well, the Bible says this, the Bible says this. You know, I don't care what your Catholic church says. And I said, bro, just think about it. Jesus left the church. And the, with the authority the church was given by Jesus, they decided which books would be in the Bible. And that church was the Catholic church. There was no other church. You know, over the centuries, we, we, we didn't have like a, a canon of books that we knew this is what belongs in the Bible to the 5th century. 
And that was decided by the Catholic bishops who got their authority passed down from the apostles. And my next video is going to be on the Sacrament of Holy Orders, proving this. But for now, I'll just keep it brief. Jesus gave his authority to the church, to the apostles, and they passed it down to men they can trust and passed it down and passed it down. That's why the Catholic Church is the only church that can show you historically from every pope. We have historical records, even Wikipedia, you can Google every pope from Pope Francis, an unbroken chain down to Peter from the Bible, St. Peter, the Apostle Peter. And we also have unbroken chains of each priest. Each priest in your parish can trace his lineage. He, we have the books all the way back to one of the apostles. Only church that can do that. Our Ortho, Eastern Orthodox brothers can do it as well. But in Protestantism, out of the 40,000 Protestant Christian denominations, none of them could do that. So God gave the church authority not only to decide which books would be in the Bible, uh, and, they ha and he had to give them infallible authority, unless you believe R.C. Sproul, the late R.C. Sproul, Protestant theologian, who said we have an inf a, a fallible collection of infallible books. So in other words, uh, the books that we have in there are infallible, they're perfect, but there could be other books. And in the beginning, God made a mistake and allowed the church to put seven books in the Old Testament that Martin Luther took out. I mean, that's, that's the best they can come up with. Uh, that's, that is the best they can come up with on that. So not only did God give the authority to forgive sins to the church, the authority to decide which books should be in the Bible, uh, he also gave us the church authority to interpret the Bible. Now, a fallacy that I believed when I was an evangelical was that the church uh, discourages Catholic Christians to read the Bible. That couldn't be any further from the tr truth. In the last five years of going to Catholic Mass every Sunday, I heard more Bible coming out of the pulpit than 30 years as an evangelical, and that's the truth. And in addition to that, they encourage, they encourage Bible reading. So, but... The Bible itself says sometimes things are hard to understand, that we need an interpreter. So God gave us an infallible interpreter, the church. Just like if everybody had a pocket constitution, that'd be great to know your constitution just to be a good citizen. But we need the Supreme Court at times to interpret it for us. And the Bible says the same thing. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 14 through 16. Therefore, beloved, since you await these things, be eager to be found without spot or blemish before him at peace. And consider the patience of our Lord as salvation, as our beloved, beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, also wrote to you, speaking of these things, as he does in all his letters, in them there are some things hard to understand, that the ignorant and unstable distort to their own destruction, just as they do the other scriptures. John Calvin came out with this doctrine that every believer can interpret the Bible. That as long as you believe in Christ, you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you don't need the church to tell you. That we would all find the Trinity on our own. We would all find the basic Christian doctrines on our own. That we didn't need a church to teach us. But that goes against what the Bible itself says right there. So getting back uh, to priests forgiving sins, I'm going to end this with uh, the book of James. And this was a book Martin Luther took out of his Bible as well. I, I did a couple videos on that, but thank God the Protestants put it back in. So all my Protestants can read this with me. All my Protestant friends watching, you can read this with me. James chapter 5, verses 13 through 15. Is anyone among you suffering? He should pray. Is anyone in good spirits? He should sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? So at this point, you're doing everything on your own. But he says, if anyone among you is sick, he should summon the presbyters of the church. The word presbyter in this uh, comes from the word presbyterius. Uh, in some uh, translation, it's translated as elders. 
and in some translations it's translated as priests. So he's saying, call the priests. He should summon the presbyters of the church, and they should pray over him and anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith, now it's the presbyters praying, and the prayer of faith will save the sick person, and the Lord will raise him up. If he has committed any sins, he will be forgiven. So it's saying, call the priests if you're sick, let them pray for you, and they'll forgive you of your sins as well. So that's the ministry of reconciliation. You find that ministry of reconciliation in 2 Corinthians. Uh, that's your homework to find that. But like I said, the Catholic Church was the church that Jesus established. The only argument you could have is to say they went astray, they added stuff, or they took stuff away. But that can be disproven by looking at what the church taught in the first three centuries and what it teaches now. And it hasn't changed. They haven't changed one single doctrine. Protestants have changed doctrines. The Catholic Church has never changed a doctrine in 2,000 years. And according to the authority that God has given the church, they teach, yes, God does forgive sins. But if you have a mortal sin, a sin that leads to death, and that's going to be a whole other video because as an evangelical, I would say all sins are the same, and as long as you trust in God, all your sins are forgiven, past, present, future. But the, God, the Bible clearly teaches that some sins lead to death. It says that in the Bible. And what the church has called them are mortal sins, which means sins that lead to death. And they're talking about spiritual death. And the church, with her authority, says those sins need to be confessed to a priest. Your venial sins, your smaller sins that we sin every day, can be cleansed with the Eucharist and through prayer, straight, you know, just you and the Lord. But mortal sins you need to get to confession. And... Um, the church also teaches if you intend to get to confession and you die before you get there, you're still forgiven if there's no way you can get to a priest. So it's not like, bam, my mortal sin didn't get to the priest, got hit by a car, I'm going to hell. That's not what the church teaches. And the church has this authority because Jesus gave them the authority to bind and loose. And he gave them the authority to forgive and retain sins. So there you have it, the Sacrament of Reconciliation, famously known as Confession in the Bible. And it's just a great blessing. As um, Peter Cripps says, he loves confession because he walks in as Adam and walks out as Jesus. And if you're heavy burdened and sin has got you down, run to the confessional and Jesus will set you free. God bless.